Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for being uh, back in time. Uh, I would like to share my appreciation for the uh, previous session. I think there were wonderful speeches, so thank you so much. Uh, but the bad news for you is that we will have even better ones in this session. <laughs> so make a good competition here. Uh, well, uh, it's my pleasure and my honor to uh, be the moderator of this uh, last session of this uh, of today. Uh, and I am also uh, able to uh, share a few thoughts with you on uh, the theme of this afternoon, which will be a little bit broader than, than uh, the, the, the blockchain and the uh, technological infrastructure. We will also see a little bit behind and, and beyond uh, the technical infrastructure, which also has been done by uh, some of the previous speakers, but for us the focus is a little bit more on uh, yeah, innovation in general, but especially on what's the value of innovation and what's the value beyond financial value. And we strongly believe that this can only be achieved if people and organizations work and innovate together. That's why we gave it the name combinatoric innovation, make new combinations. And the innovation emerges from these new combinations. And what we're looking for is the transformation of financial and societal capital. It's the creation and transformation of societal and financial capital. Uh, my name is uh, Paul Iske, I'm a professor at uh, Maastricht University, somewhere in the south of the Netherlands, but the Netherlands is so small that you wouldn't tell the difference between the south and the north. Um, and uh, actually, uh, it, it's also quite a flat country, nevertheless, the, the biggest mountain of the country is f uh, located in the south of the country, it's at least 300 meters high. Um, so, talking about the nature, talking about uh, geography, uh, like I already said during the panel, we are experiencing a perfect storm. There are so many things happening at the same time, and we have to deal with all those different phenomena at the same time. And we have to find new solutions. And these solutions probably only exist in the collective. Nobody and nothing can have the solution in a very small or isolated environment. The solutions are amongst us, are between us, will be found when we work together. That's what we're looking for. And we need to find new solutions. And that was also very clearly illustrated by the uh, great presentation of uh, Knut Holman from Sparebanken, from Norway. If we stay the, the organizations we are, and we always have been, whether, uh, whether you're a bank or something else, game is over. Because the world is changing, and in this changing world, we need different solutions. We need different organizations, because everything will be different. The former and uh, the first president of the European Bank once said, a bank actually is nothing more than a computer with a marble porch. And that's what we see now. We see that other organizations understand this and say, wait, if that's true, then we can also be a bank. And that's true for many other types of organizations. Or other organizations can play the role that, other, uh, that we always uh, have played. And that's not only true for, uh, for finance. It's also happening in healthcare, where you see a lot of new technology entering the healthcare market and create complete new models, business models, new health models, including health economics. But also people are much more able to monitor and to manage their own health. You see it also in the legal sector, and Arthur gave a very good uh, explanation of what's happening at the moment also in the legal sector related to blockchain, but it's more general. Many things are happening in, in, in the legal sector as well, even in, in, in the IT sector, in, in all sectors. And the only thing we certainly know is that this is true. Actually, my background is in physics, and I always have been taught the lesson, less is more. And that's I, why I'm always surprised when I read business books, because that seems that more is more. Because uh, the main message of this book, you will find it on the front page. So you can ask the question, what's in the other 172 pages? Probably more uh, extension of the same message. But yeah, you don't sell a book with one page, I've been told. But the, but the message is true. We have to change. We have to innovate. And for me, an innovation means it's a process of transforming ideas in new forms of value. It's new types of value, but then you, obviously the question is, what is value? And value is what has value for you. And that can be financial value, 
but it can also be societal value, social capital, ecological, natural capital. And it can also be knowledge, intellectual capital, relations, new systems. That's also value. And what we talk about when we talk about innovation is the creation of these forms of value. And for sure, if, if you destroy capital in one of these three areas, if you destroy societal value, if you destroy intellectual capital, it's a no-go area. So we, now we have a more holistic view on, on value, and that means that we have to move away from business cases and we are going to work on value cases, where value is created, value is being transformed, but in all three areas. Just, you can only be sustainable if at least you produce uh, value in all three areas. You cannot, I mean, there's a lot of uh, discussion now going on about social entrepreneurship. And some of the social enterprises, they only lose money. That is also not sustainable. So we have to find a, yeah, a, a way to produce value in all these areas. And, and we see that there's a strong demand from society because people are more and more aware of what's happening around them. They're more and more concerned about things. They're more and more issues driven. They see what's happening with the planet. They see what's happening with population. They see what's happening with technology. They see what's happening with peace. That's all very important for them. And as an example, uh, uh, Norway is such a small country that we highlighted a little bit today. Norway has made a lot of money with, with, uh, with fossil fuels. And they have a very big fund, and that al almost contains a trillion dollar. Eh? Imagine, four million people, five million people have a fund with a trillion dollar in it. And they, the aim is to invest less and less in fossil fuels. Eh? They made money with fossil fuels, but they don't want to reinvest it in fossil fuels. Very interesting. That's the shift that's happening. So the, uh, and, the, and the way forward is to, to innovate and to innovate together. That's, uh, for instance, why recently uh, the, Norwegian, the new Norwegian oil has been uh, developed, and the new Norwegian oil means Open Innovation Lab. Yeah. Open Innovation Lab, the abbreviation is also oil. Looking for a new future, a future with another role of, of, of oil, of fossil fuels. I don't say no role, but it's another role. Will the other society, will the other economy, we have to transform the economy, like you have to do in Korea. And you can only do that together. Now, this formula has been shown before, I think it's the third time today, but it, it, it's by, uh, with a good reason, because it's extremely important. Just bringing in a lot of new technology and not changing the fundamentals of the society will not work. It gives you, like we said, an expensive old society. So you really have to think also about how do people connect, how do organizations connect, how do they work together, how do they create value together. That's the discussion. And this is in a complex world. It, it's, like this picture that is uh, indicating a complex situation. If, if you change something on the right-hand side, you have no idea what will be the impact on the left-hand side. People ask me every now and then what's happening here in the first place. Balls go in, balls go out. Uh, this is about the primary business process of a bank. Uh, and, and people pay for this. Um, now, if you want to move on uh, and you want to be successful in such a dynamic, complex environment, you need to navigate. You can no longer control the world. That's, that's the past. The future is navigation. See what's happening, act and react. Play your role, work together, have interactions. That's the way to be successful in this hyper-connected world, which is also very complex. It's complex by design. And in order to master this, we have to think about what makes us human beings so intelligent. Why can we deal with, intelligent, uh, with uh, complex problems? Because we have a complex brain. And the complexity of our brain is not just because we have so many brain cells, it's because of the connections between the brain cells. That makes this complex system that can think about very complex things. I remember the anecdote in the, in, in the 20th century, early 20th century, when we started to discover the secrets of the, of the very small particles of the atoms and even smaller. And one physicist once said, why are these atoms so small? He was very frustrated because it was so difficult to do research on something so small as an atom. And then Niels Bohr, the famous physicist, Nobel Prize winner, he said, it's because we human beings are so big. And the reason to say this is because if you want to think about a concept as an atom, you have to have a very complex brain that is much bigger than the, the single atom itself. 
And I think many problems that we see in the, uh, nowadays and the opportunities we see, the developments we see, need complex thinking, need us working together, need us joint forces. And the good news is that knowledge is everywhere. There's no shortage of knowledge. It's, it's in the room. It, I mean, there are about uh, 150 people here in the room with an average, I would say, 20, 20 years of experience. So already 3,000 years of experience in this room alone. So there's no shortage of knowledge. And that helps us to move from the traditional model of innovation where somebody has an idea, thinks about it, and puts it into the market, which is a good model and has worked for many years and probably will still work, but there is an additional model now. And of course, that will be open innovation. And in open innovation, you also, uh, you're good in something and, and, and you, st you, you have a market or you have a product or you have a, te a technology, but you know that you have to work together with others to have more impact, to really innovate. And that means that you have to be able to connect to the outside world. You have to cross the boundary. And that's the new skill you have to develop. How to find other people, other organizations that have complementary skills, complementary competences, complementary ambitions. And first you have to be able to find them, you have to be able to connect, and you have to be able to work together. These are competencies that are extremely important in the world that has been described also by the previous speakers and by the speakers that will come after me. So it's this, these new combinations that I think are the driving force for a lot of innovation. Because, for instance, if you talk about uh, uh, the, the new developments that we see, including the blockchain, including the internet of uh, everyone and everything, and you, you name it, most of these technologies are already there for m quite some years. It's the new combinations that at the end of the day give us also this real innovation that we see nowadays. And it also every now and then gives us surprises. Eh? I already said we have to navigate, we cannot control. That means that we also have surprises. Good surprises, maybe uh, not such a good uh, surprises. And the word that's being used is the serendipity. Serendipity is the skill, it is a skill to find something very important by coincidence. It, you, it's because you create the circumstances, you create the conditions so that things can happen. What will happen, I don't know. But that things can happen, that's the most important thing. A Dutch eye surgeon, Peck van Andel is his name, he once said, you know, serendipity is looking for the needle in the haystack and then finding the beautiful daughter of the farmer. That is serendipity. And the most important question here is, what can we do together? <laughs> uh, and for those of you who know these uh, funny videos, will it blend? What can we do together? That's the most important question. And, and it means that we need to develop new skills. Skills work together. Skills to get out of the box, get out of uh, our uh, own limited environment and build new interfaces. And to be able to su be successful in this game, in this connecting game, you have to think about three things. First of all, there must be a kind of cultural fit. It means that you have to understand each other, you have to agree on certain ways of working, certain norms, certain values, this is what we believe in. Yeah, and we will hear some stories about privacy, this is also a kind of value that we have. The other one is a strategic fit. If I want to achieve my goals and you want to achieve my goals, I hope that can be, uh, can be done together. Then we have a strategic fit. And of course, there needs to be an operational fit. We have to speak the same language as an example. Uh, we have to be able to connect systems and data in systems that can talk to each other. Uh, we have to have a kind of standard for information sharing, for knowledge sharing, uh, all those things. Uh, uh, this is very operational stuff, but it has to be managed. So if we want to be successful in this complex world and, and this connected world and this combinatoric world, we have to focus on these three areas. This is what we see, for instance, if you look at the, the, the block tech world that has been described. There are so many uh, different parties with different roles in the system, with different models, if, if you want to be successful as an individual uh, or party, you have to be able to connect. It's the same with APIs. Uh, you can only have a successful API if you know how to connect to the different parts of the, uh, of the infrastructure you want to connect to. Now, let's focus a little bit on, on people. I already referred to the south of the Netherlands, and the south of the Netherlands was very famous uh, for, for mining industry. So we, uh, it was coal was being mined over there. And, and uh, about 40 years ago, 30, 40 years ago, we decided to stop pr producing coal. 
the, uh, because well, the, the coal mines were more or less exhausted. Uh, there was a transformation to new forms of energy. So what to do? What to do? And people decided we want to have a transformation to a new economy. And that's what I think is also very, uh, I, I, I really admire the ability of Korea to, to have a fundamental transformation that you have gone through in the past 50 years. Now, we have a similar type of thing, not as a large scale as Korea, but we, we, we've gone a little bit further, I think, uh, in, in, in one way, so I will describe that part. So we went from coal mining and we started to develop the knowledge economy. So first of the thing we did, we, we founded a university. And then we tried to b create new business, new uh, ec uh, economy, new activities in this knowledge economy. And you see the difference uh, uh, the coming from the mines, com uh, going, coming out, coming uh, above the surface. So we, from the dark uh, uh, lens, we produced what we now call the bright lens. And it is, has been a continuous journey, uh, journey of continuous change. And very important here is the collaboration. Again, the combination of three forces. The government, the private sector, the companies, and the knowledge institutes, university, uh, schools, and so on. And we call this the triple helix approach. Very much working together to make it happen. And the result, amongst others, is now that we have four campus environments. One focusing on health and life sciences, one on gamma calls and new materials, one on smart services, big data, smart data, and, uh, and one on uh, food and, 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 and uh, health uh, and, and nutrition. And the interesting thing is these obviously are connected. For instance, smart services is, is playing a big role also in healthcare, of course. And new materials can also be connected to health, uh, and the new tissues and all those things. And food, of course, is also related to health and and, and uh, new materials can be used for packaging. So you see there's a clear crossover between those campus environments. So here you see the Camelot campus. Uh, that has, uh, it has been built on, on, on the area of a, of a former chemical company, which was more or less the product of the, of, the, uh, of the mining industry. It's called Dutch State Mines, DSM, but it has nothing to do with mining anymore. And uh, this, this typically doesn't look like a mine, does it? Uh, then we have the health campus where we have also very interesting developments. We, for instance, we have one of the strongest magnets in the world is here in this, uh, in this area, and they, do this, they use this magnet for, for uh, brain research, but brain research can be applied to health uh, applications, but also can be used for neuromarketing type of research. So you see, again, a crossover. And then, of course, then with the, with the data uh, uh, campus. Now, we have the, the food campus, and the most recent one is the smart services campus. And this is all within an area of let's say, a maximum of, of 30 kilometers. So uh, from many, uh, in many countries, that would be exactly at the same place. We think it's, uh, it's, it's separated, but it's not. So it's bright lens. As an example, if you look at smart materials, then you see many different applications, like uh, packaging, uh, electronic devices, uh, energy storage, recycling, and so on. So you see, this is really the new industry. It's, it's very knowledge intensive, it's data driven, it's high tech, and uh, you, you, can you can make it happen. And uh, you see also that it is attracting a lot of new type of companies, corporates, uh, startups, SMEs, also various different types of organizations because we really believe in diversity. So just bringing a lot of this, uh, tech companies together, like you see, for instance, in Silicon Valley, uh, it, it's a great place. We believe that it is also important to have a mix of companies, not just uh, tech companies, but also companies for, with, a, with a completely different background and also in different stadia of, the li uh, of their lives. Uh, so uh, existing corporates, but also startups and, and small companies and big companies. All of this together. And uh, this is a real investment that we make. Uh, uh, in total, we, we talk about something about a half a billion euro, which I think uh, is uh, half a trillion uh, one, if I'm uh, not mistaken. Um, so it, it's really serious money. But it's all about bringing people together, leveraging the skills and the uh, ambitions of people, bringing them in the right context. Now, this is happening in the Holland, but I think it, hap it could happen everywhere. And, and why is, uh, what's so special about the Netherlands? Eh? We already have seen during the uh, presentation of the special report that Holland has been very prosperous in the past. 
I can tell you we're not that poor yet. Uh, so uh, still uh, some of these entrepreneurial uh, and, and uh, value generation capabilities are still in the country. But we are a very open society. And one of the reasons that we are very open is, is that we are a relatively small uh, country, but we are very much facing the rest of the world. We are uh, located uh, near the water, as an example. So we have a kind of strategic position. But the same uh, is true for, for Norway. Uh, you see, Norway is also a very big coastline. It's, it's a relatively small country, especially if you look in terms of population, not so much in, uh, in, in uh, area, but in population. But uh, we also have a guest from Oman who will also give a lecture tomorrow. Oman more or less has the same uh, quality. It's a relatively small country. It's strategically positioned. It's, it's, it's open water. So it's also relative to the rest of the Middle East, an open society. And I think if you look at uh, Korea, you could say the same thing. Korea has an uh, eminent uh, position. Uh, it, it, could be, uh, it could be one of the guide uh, countries in the, in, in, in the region because of the fact that you are an open society, you have shown that you can transform, you have, can, you have shown that you can connect uh, with each other, with the future, with other uh, countries. And I think that's, uh, that is very important to be successful. So this is my uh, small introduction. Uh, again, uh, it's about making new combination. It's about, it's about focusing on other types of value than just financial value. It's giving technology its position it deserves. It, it, it's extremely important what's happening at the moment with technology. It's really driving a lot of changes, but I think it can only be uh, useful, it can only be uh, realize its potential if we also focus on the other uh, aspects of innovation, which we usually call social innovation. The relationships between people, the relationship between organizations, the, re the relationship between nations, and also the interrelations. Uh, so with that, I would like to uh, uh, close my uh, contribution, and uh, I'm very happy to introduce the next speaker. Uh, the next speaker is uh, Mr. Theo Breuers. Uh, he, uh, actually, he is from the south of the Netherlands, uh, uh, and, and, and Theo is a, a very, uh, has a very interesting and long career in creating value with software. Uh, he, has, uh, he started his uh, company called Composoft, uh, many years ago, and he has uh, developed a, a, a whole range of products focusing on um, uh, ticketing, for instance. Uh, he's doing, uh, he's, he's produced uh, the software for uh, the systems for do ticketing, for instance, for the Olympic Games. Um, and uh, 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 payrolling is also an, an pro uh, a product of him, uh, how to uh, uh, very efficiently do the administration of, of uh, people uh, working temporarily for other organizations and also people who work for companies uh, in general. But uh, he's here to tell another story because uh, Theo is a very passionate person about creating value for community, for society. And uh, he's, uh, he's always searching for how can we use software to create societal value together with economic value. And this is especially important in the south of the Netherlands where continuously we need uh, new initiatives, new innovation to, uh, to, 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 yeah, to create value for that particular part of the country, which is not the central part of the country. It's not Amsterdam, it's not Rotterdam, the, the cities you may know. It's outside these cities. So how do we help this type of, or, uh, of, of, of parts of the country also to flourish? Uh, Theo has uh, done a lot of uh, work on this, and uh, I'm very happy that he has been willing to come here and share some of his uh, ideas and experiences with us. Thank you so much. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Paul introduced me already on a beautiful way. I want to talk about you a little bit how we can change uh, parts of a region to work better together. Three years, in, in 2013, we started uh, to build a ticketing platform. We didn't just want to make an ordinary ticket platform with all the tickets, because there are many of these. That doesn't make any sense to build the same as what other companies do. And I have trouble to find here a way how companies can work together to use these types of tickets. So we didn't. We want to make something extraordinary. 
we had the extraordinary, extraordinary claims were related on the history of uh, the company. The company was founded in 1983 and in the Netherlands, still on the same place where we are now. And we opened the subdivision in Prüm in Germany in 1985. In, it was a small town in Germany, but it was very easy to get employees there. Uh, programmers and even people for the office. But in the year 1995, we had a problem. People were leaving the little town to the bigger towns, where they had universities and much more jobs opportunities. But there was also more to do. This town was nearly 100 km kilometers away from a big town. That is, for Europe, is that a big distance? Maybe not here, but we are not talking in that way. You heard already from Paul that we are talking about a distance of 30 kilometers in the circle in the south of Limburg, what we find already a big distance. That's not true. So we had to find, uh, and at first the good people went out because they had studied, they could easily go. But later on, uh, much more people left the town and the area in order to find a job closer to the biggest towns where they could do everything what they wanted. The area had gone first to start to lose its young people. They left the town and made it very, easy, very difficult to get more young people again in because no one was any longer interested in an area which buildings are closing, where you don't have any young people. So everything, the cinema was closing, everything what was important, you didn't have sport clubs anymore because there were no young people who could be interactive in, uh, could be active in that. Most of the money in this town in Prune was made by the tourist industry. So the tourist industry couldn't get any longer young people for working in the evening and in the weekend, so also the tourist industry had to close down. The results you see vacant shops, homes, and offices. In order to survive in Germany, we had to move our shop to also to a bigger town. So we moved to Aachen, which is a, a big town with a good university, around 100 kilometers from the place we were. But there, we came another problem. It was very difficult for us to get programmers, because this university town had already a lot of software houses. So we had uh, very difficult to get it there. Now, in 2010, we got the same process in the Netherlands. Most of the people, that's what they told us, I'm not any longer telling that it is true, told us that they were from my age. So it was getting gray in the area. Later on, we found out that it is not true, that the name, the, the age of the people is much younger than my age. So that's okay already. But we had the same, we thought we we're gonna get the same problems. And it's happening also on this moment. Many people left the company, left the country, the, the part of this, uh, uh, this part of Netherlands. Even we have beautiful universities from a very high quality, what Paul also already said, and also high schools and everything what you need is in a very good quality there. But people want to go to The Hague or to Amsterdam or Rotterdam. They don't want to stay here. We have the same problem in Maastricht and also in Aachen and in Hasselt, which also is a university. Many people from foreign, foreign students we have. It's very difficult to keep them in our region because they go back to their country. So we have the same problem again. Uh, but we learned now a little bit more. So we, were going to, we thought we have to find out a way that we can make the world around us accept it. And that people want to stay there because they can earn money there. For entrepreneurs, there's a job, they can open, open shops or what else, and other people can work in these shops. But we had another problem again which was coming, this is some pictures of this region. It's a beautiful, it's also a tourist region, so that makes it also again difficult to change things. We got sales through internet. 
many things are sold by internet, but the companies who are selling this are not located in our area. They also again located in Amsterdam and in Rotterdam. So this move money is also moving the, 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 the region. When we started developing the ticket platform, we were confronted with the following issues. Every ticket can be in transaction. It can be a reserve seat ticket, an admission ticket, but also a service, a gift, or a gift card. And by gift, I think, it's something like crowdfunding. If you want to move from one place to another place, you need a moving company. Many people, students, can't pay the moving company. So what does the moving company? He puts an iframe on the side and said, this guy wants to move. Do you want to give him a, 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 a gift? So that's also another part of gift, making it to uh, try to get money to help other people to move. Another thing was a gift card. Our gift cards are only have a value date of one year. After that year, we sent the buyer a message. Your gift card is still not used, so we still have the money in our bank. And then we tell them, if you don't use or wait, you give the gift card on in the next month, we will give you your money back. I think this is normal. We trust, they trusted us to buy the gift card, so if they don't use it, we have to trust them that they forgot it or sounds. That's why we send them the email. And even if they don't use it then, then we give them the money back. That's also, I think, new forms of how you have to go on with money from other people. The, post, the, the platform also needs to use uh, all uh, various tickets forms you have. So you, have to, you, can, you, must, uh, you can use it to visit a theater uh, and be seated with the ticket form. And you must go to a festival, a hotel, a restaurant, a zoo. Everything should be inside. First, we only, and that was the part when we were only uh, orientated on the leisure industry. The software needs also to facilitate the organizers of the ticket shop to bring down their working time. People who organize something don't want to sit behind the computer. So make it easy for them that they can do it very, very fast and still in a good solution. We want, we want uh, to create software to enhance the cohesion of communicate, communi communi communities through their own digital space for social and economic corporations. We started uh, the software to build in 2013. 2015, we came within the market and we tried it in a small region which has about 15,000 uh, people uh, living there. We sold in the first year about 50,000 uh, tickets and this 50,000 uh, tickets was good for the creation of 35, 35 uh, full-time full jobs what we created with because we sell also for restaurants, for hotels and all these kind of things. So it was quite good but we wanted to work to let pe work people together and they didn't work together. We gave them the opportunity in the system to say I as a hotel I want to work together with the zoo. And the zoo says, why? I have my customers. So we couldn't connect these people. So we were thinking about new things. Why? There are problems. People don't listen to the customers. And if they listen to the customers, they only listen with half an ear. And they, even the dog in the top, he doesn't look and only use one ear. The other one is very active. He looks and he hears. He uses everything what he can do to find out what the customer wants. For this reason, we think if it is not possible to get it from our customers by themselves, we have to organize cross-selling by ourselves. So we, de we developed a uh, virtual network with and in combination uh, with uh, machine learning. So if you buy now a ticket for the zoo, we can give you a recommendation what the next thing or what you else would like to buy. And we use a lot of this databases. We use the historical data, our own database. We use the data of the customer, but we also use databases of weather, of traffic, everything in what you can think, opening times, uh, if it is possible to go from A to B in a, uh, in a special time. 
So we use this all. We started with this in uh, 2016, and we have now already 35% of all the shops using it on this moment. And everyone who buys one ticket, buys 30% of these people buys a second ticket for someone, something else. So it is possible to collect it and to do this by uh, computer. But this all was done in one sector. It was done in the leisure industry. And we wanted to do more. We wanted to create a complete digital world for this region. So in cooperation with Professor Paul Iske and uh, Rabobank, what is the second biggest bank in the Netherlands, we are starting next month to do not only this in just one sector, but as much as possible sectors in this specific area. We wanted to strengthen the cohesion and communities through their own digital space for social and economic corporations. The, the targets are better cooperation, joint development, optimizing communication, and show the demand and supply within communities keep the money in the area. So we want to put, we want to pump the money every time back in the area. So you buy from e, A, and A buys something from C, and C buys something from B, and it's going around everywhere, this money. We give the entrepreneurs, yep. We, bring, we are not talking about things or applications. What we want to do is to talk about people. We bring the people together, the inhabitants in this region, the entrepreneurs, the members of associations, foundations, cooperatives, caregivers, heal care providers, directors and officers of communities, visitors of the area, students. It's nearly everything what we want to bring together. Ford, when uh, he introduced the T-Ford, he was stealing ideas from others. He didn't talk with the other ones where he got these ideas from. I think when he should have talked with the other ones and made a, com a combinatorial innovation, he could have made the Mustang car, I think, 20 years earlier than what he did. Because it was only his idea, not an idea of many people. Einstein, he was nearly very close by a definition of social innovation, but he missed a couple of things. He wanted to bring it out and then make it again, make it again, make it again. If he had this model already, what we're using in these days, he could do it already in a much or earlier time. The combination of the social innovation and combinatorial innovation makes it possible to develop new forms of cooperation, leading to joint new products, where every participant has its own value creation and to get beyond where the individual entrepreneur would come. So everyone has a part of it. It is his part which is together. And this, all these parts together make a much better product than when it were all single products. It, this kind of innovation also creates a, a bond of mutual trust by the infinite value creation. By collecting big data and make it anonymous, anonymous, available to the participating entrepreneurs, they can improve their knowledge about customers and potential customers as targeted to increase sales. Data collection through for sales and reservations made on the internet and the participants. This can build up as its own customer tracking system. This is what small shops in town don't have. They don't know how their customer is. They don't have an email address. So there is no normal way. It's only advertising in a magazine how they can communicate with these people. And then participant in this can everyone who offers something. So the whole 
names I told you already from the inhabitants to uh, the students can use it. Our plan. We created an internet site which is more than less a digital city, where as much as possible people out of the area can, partici can uh, participate. For instance, we gave entrepreneurs the possibility to sell products through this internet site. They can place a maximum number of 10 products on the site. These products can be ordered by anyone. There's only one restriction. You have to pick up the products in the shop. And you can pay directly in the sh in, uh, on the internet or you pay in the shop. Doesn't make any difference for us. We do this in, uh, in uh, we work together with that, with a communication act called uh, Comi. And Comi is a mixed app where people very easy can communicate to each other. But it also gives the possibility if, for instance, we have all the inhabitants in one communication app and the entrepreneurs in another one, we can later on make combinations on this. And you can share all the whole new app or you picked only that out from uh, people where you really want to talk with. To learn the people how they would like to work, there will be three discussion sessions. And the first one, we will tell them uh, our dream and how they can also dream and make the pe perfect world in their area in the next five years. So it is now not any longer the government and the banks what says what will happen in the next five years. No, they will make also their own plans and they can discuss it or discuss it in a group with these kinds of people. This is also a value what we create on that way for them. We're going to discuss with them how they're going to reach their perfect world. How they're going to, what they have to do to create this. In the sec sec second ses session, we will show them the system, how it works, and introduce them to the trainers. As trainers, we also we are looking also for people who lost their jobs. There were many people by staff reductions, uh, by banks and insurance companies, which still ha doesn't have a job. These people are very well indicated and did advice work in the past. So we could use them to advise and to help the entrepreneurs and all the other ones in the beginning. During the last session, the third one, we're going to look how, are, how far we are and, and, and are we are on the right track. We will show them that they are the exclusive, exclusive of project. Let them let them tell if their sales increase and if they are happier now. We can help them, but they have to do it by themselves. Same as by the Olympic Games. They bring the light, but the organizer and the athletes can make the games to a success. Short term re uh, results we will hope to have is uh, knowledge, more knowledge about products and customers used of the databases we get, so is that. We, want, we hope that we get a lot of collaboration so that I get new products in the region and people will work on that by the knowledge also from others. And medium terms, we think uh, that the counteracting vacations of shops and homes will go down and customers get back into the village and the inner, in, inner cities. For the employees' opportunities, uh, if people really start to buy local and the entrepreneurs also think that they're uh, going to start uh, local, we think that in a region about, uh, from about 15,000 uh, people, it must be possible to create in three years 150 new jobs. And that is a tremendous number what we would create then uh, in a very short time. And it will be open. We will have shops again. And the cow on the right side, we used because oh. mm. yeah, the cow was the symbol of how it was in the in the past. This country had cows, and we had all kind of stupid things with animals, which people don't like anymore. But it's over now. It's now nice country and happy customers.
If you have a happy customer, you have a happy entrepreneur. With that, we also will work together with Stanford University and they will do a study about the whole project during the next three years. Everyone is optimistic and thank you for your attention. Thank you, okay. thank you Theo, for uh, sharing your uh, great work you're doing in the, in the Netherlands. Uh, it's, it's, it's based on, on the vast experience you have in, in getting people to products, to, uh, to entertainment, to, uh, to events. Uh, it's, it's connected to uh, no, the work you've done on creating business intelligence. Actually, I, I prefer to talk about intelligent business, uh, how to deal in an intelligent way with all that information. And, and the last step you're now taking is how to transform this into value for society in general, both for the customers as well as for the entrepreneurs, and by doing so for the, for the whole of the society with a great impact. So I think that is a very interesting and very intelligent way of uh, improving society. Uh, and for that you also need to have interactions between people and for interactions you need trust. And that brings me to the, the next speaker. And we are very honored that uh, Jan Kruppinger is here. He, uh, he's from MIT, he's a distinguished uh, research fellow at MIT with a long-standing experience in issues related to uh, identity, to uh, auth uh, authentication, to trust on the internet. He has been, he has been founding uh, companies in this area. Uh, he's a member of the uh, World Economic Forum, of the uh, leadership uh, panel. So I think uh, we must be very happy that he uh, has been willing to come here and share his uh, experience. And uh, indeed, he's focusing uh, in his talk also on, uh, on the glue that, that makes, uh, or, or the, the, the lubrication, the oil that makes it possible for us to do the transactions, which is trust. So thank, thank you so much, thank and the floor is yours. Well, it, it's a real pleasure and a, a honor to be here to be able to speak to this group. And I know it's the end of the day, and people have been talking a lot about blockchain. And, um, Primarily from the perspective of financial transactions, um, and I'm, I'm going to make like two major points in my talk, and one of them is, is that we're going through a very basic transformation of creating a whole new ecology, a whole new way. Uh, we're digitizing everything, and by that kind of transformation, we're going to create different kinds of institutions. And I'd like to argue that this is happening a lot faster uh, than we think, and that the, there's a whole class of technologies that are coming around to make this happen. And we're at a point where we're going to start to have to design new kinds of social ins and economic institutions. And we're going to have to do it in a digital way. And so th our foundations in which we think about things like industrial democracy and voting, a lot of the institutions that we're familiar with and how we govern ourselves, I think are going to be transformed. And so we're moving from something like what was once a, what happened with an industrial democracy when you went from a feudal system to a market-based system, we're now moving into more, I would argue, a data-rich environment, it's decentralized, in which technology is going to play a larger and more powerful role in governance. So with that point, we're all familiar with uh, the Moore's Law and so the exponential growth of, of transistors, and that's been used to characterize technology innovation for many, uh, for quite some time. And then Moore's law arguably still still applies today. But then you're seeing even a hyper curves taking place in, in in genomic processing. That's an area that that is even growing a lot faster. So we're not only sort of changing different, we're processing sort of our, our computer processing time. We're also being able to pro process our own genome. And we're actually changing how we understand ourselves, and that's going through an exponential curve. And then we're going through an evolution or a fusion of different technologies. So if you're in the fields now and you start out in computer science, that's fusing with, with biology. We're getting nanoscience coming together with what people have popularly called the singularity, whether you believe in that whole notion of, of the great rapture of technology, rapture happening in another 15 years. It's fair to say that there's a fusion of technologies taking place. And it's creating an entirely different environment from which we're going to uh, inhabit. And it's going to change us. We're going to co-evolve with it. It's going to change us. We're going to change it. It's something that's upon us. It's not something we can push aside. It's here now. 
And what's key to this is, is how to think about data. I mean, a lot of people, we think about data as a set of observations. That's our, what we've been taught in school. You collect data, you look at things, you make observations, you make predictions, you, do, you know your customer, and it's, it's sort of outside looking in. But what we're really doing, we're immersed in data. Data is a critical source of life. It's a critical nutrient in order to drive a lot of different processes. So we're creating a whole infrastructure that depend on access to data. It's more like water than oil. You, there's a little reference to sort of oil. I would say data is more like water because it creates, infuses life. And if someone, if someone pollutes it, if someone tries to dam it up, if someone tries to contain it, then it destroys the whole ecosystem. So it, it's really, it's, 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 it's important to get the right set of metaphors and how to think about data and how to protect it and how to create the, uh, the integrity of data. Because this is what's driving the environment. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with this. Do you have any idea what these, these people are running for? No. What could possibly be driving people like that? Pokemon Go. They're trying to get, capture a Pokemon. And the point I went, when you were making an earlier point about game mechanics, it's amazing how quickly this world comes upon us. I mean, Pokemon was a success, you know, was a, did a billion dollars in seven months in 55 different countries. Um, but it also created a virtual society like overnight. And people are chasing this thing, this augmented, this Pokemon. Um, and there are actually a lot of things in Pokemon and the mechanics of Pokemon that mirror society because you're actually creating different asset classes, you're able to have exchange them, you're able to give people rewards, you're able to uh, have people buy more virtual goods. So you're seeing already this, this, this creation and, and, and uh, preparation of people living in an alternative world. That's not good. Okay, okay, whoops, let me, let me, can I go back on that? Nice. This is an art piece that was done of what it means to create a virtual reality, a virtual experience. I'm, I'm going to try to go through this, not go through the whole the whole video, but it's, it's illustrating what we, we, we had this earlier piece where you say you're creating this ver these augmented overlays, but the fact is that they become a, a, a way in which you actually negotiate. The, the physical and the, and the virtual become interfused, and so this artist brings up a lot of points about who you are, how do you change your identity, what happens, all sort of things that happen in the physical world start to happen in the infusion in, in, the, in the virtual world, and you have these overlays, and this this whether it can be a nightmare of things that are coming at you you don't control, you feel controlled by it, or is it something that is an expression of who you are? So who am I? All these questions start to becoming fused in these two worlds. And this is happening now. And so we're really having the virtualization of everything. And, and when you think about there's a whole set of uh, technology infrastructures I won't go into here where you have the ability to create virtual uh, data containers, and applications, Docker, API platforms, uh, you spin them up, they'd be self-ministrating. So all this, 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 this new infrastructure is happening very, very quickly. And here's an example. I mean, some people have a hard time to believe how fast these things can happen. I don't know if you get, this is Fifth Avenue in New York in 1904. And I don't know if people would see that they're, they're, where, where, the, where the car is, but there is a car in that picture. It's right there. And then you go, this is in New York in, 19, in 1912, and where's the horse? This is eight years. Eight years, you have the total transformation. And this was at a time when we didn't think it was very technologically rapid. But you have that kind of pervasive takeover of, an, of, a, of a new infrastructure. And that's what I'll argue that we're going to be seeing very shortly. And then we're in the midst of that right now. And the key issue is when you, we mentioned having the Internet of Things, there'll be trillions of Internet of Things, where a home is going to be made up of, of, of devices. Uh, but is it a home going to be our castle? Is that something we control, or is it going to be something that spies upon us? How do we know? It, there's a wonderful sequence in the um, uh, TV program called Mr. Robot, 
where, uh, I don't know if people are familiar with that, um, but it, it, it talks about the future, well, not even the future, the present, in which you're in a highly automated phone, they hack the house, and you can't get in the house, and everything goes wrong. And right now, there are not good procedures for authenticating Internet of Things. We really don't know how to do that very well. It could be the car, it could be a heart implant, it could be the light bulb, all these things. Your television set could be looking at you, spying on you, sharing the data. We're sort of stumbling into this world where we don't know what we can trust. The element of trust becomes really essential. If you're going to have a viable society, a viable economy, you've got to be able to trust what things are, what people are, who they assert, to be, who they assert themselves to be. You look at the, uh, you know, the phone. This is this wonderful device, 10 years old, uh, but it is an iPhone, my phone, spy phone. It's collecting data on me, sensor data on it. We did a project at MIT in which we took 150 students and we took all the data off their phone. We did data mining, machine learning, and we could make very strong predictions about what people would do the next day, the next minute, their depression, who they associate with. You get very rich data off those phones, and it's good data. But it could, if it's not handled right, if, it's, if you don't have control of it, if you don't trust it, if it's not in the right hands, then it's surveillance. And it's a nightmare scenario. Similarly, with, with all the devices, we're talking about smart cars, we're talking about drones. I know I've done some work. I used to work um, in the Pentagon. The whole idea of being able to say, you've got a, a satellite up there, you've got a drone up there. They don't know whether they, in the, when push comes to shove, whether they have control over that, that asset. They can't verify it. And the submarine down there, there's work at DARPA to be created an autonomous submarine, missile launching submarine that'd be totally autonomous. They better figure that out. Someone can hack a submarine. Um, but we're not there yet. So we have a lot of old infrastructures that, that are not trustworthy, and yet we're giving them more and more power. So the old issue is, who are the trusted authorities? Can it be hacked? Can it not? How do I know I can rely upon that when push comes to shove? And our, our traditional way of thinking about authorities is still, you know, it is quite traditional. It's something that's like 2,000 years old. We have very hierarchical structures that are telling us who we are, where we fit into the social hierarchy, what kinds of privileges we have or we don't have. And then they go back to the medieval chain of being in, in, in Western Europe, where that became a way of ordering society. And that's still reflected in the way universities work today, I hate to say. But you have these very traditional notions and very fixed credentials. So you have artifacts of identity. If you, who, gets, who issues a passport? What's the criteria for a passport? Social class. Peer, Burke's peerage decides where you fit in society. Same thing with your credit score. All these kind of things are powerful authorities. They've been centralized, they've been hierarchical, they've been static. Even the top, top right hand, there's something called indulgences in the Middle Ages where they sold indulgences. Where there's a, access to a resource, some party will try to monetize that and control it because that's power. And that has not changed. That's sort of the part of the human condition for as long as we know. So when the state becomes digital, and this is the Leviathan, the Thomas Hobbes, the, 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 the sovereign who's made out of the people, when you have a, a, a digital despot, you're going to have a, a physical despot being replaced by a digital despot. We have to really think about how power and authority is going to be allocated, controlled, and made accountable. So I'm going to have one little one more little uh, a video on blockchain. It's from a somewhat different perspective. Um, less to do with financial transactions than all of the do, uh, how to do with uh, uh, authorities and how do, you, how, do you, how do you create credentials you can rely upon. So we'll what try this. Vote? Have you ever wondered whether your ballot is actually counted? Can we turn if it you up? you meet someone online, how do you know they're who they say they are? When you buy coffee that's labeled fair trade, what makes you so certain of its origin? To be sure, really sure, about any of those questions, you'd need a system where records could be stored, facts could be verified by anyone, and security is guaranteed. That way, no one could cheat the system by editing records, because everyone using the system would be watching. Systems like this are on the horizon, and the software that powers them is called a blockchain. 
Blockchains store information across a network of personal computers, making them not just decentralized, but distributed. This means no central company or person owns the system, yet everyone can use it and help run it. This is important because it means it's difficult for any one person to take down the network or corrupt it. The people who run the system use their computer to hold bundles of records submitted by others, known as blocks, in a chronological chain. The blockchain uses a form of math called cryptography to ensure that records can't be counterfeited or changed by anyone else. You've probably heard of the blockchain's first killer app, a form of digital cash called Bitcoin that you can send to anyone, even a complete stranger. Bitcoin is different from credit cards, PayPal, or other ways to send money because there isn't a bank or financial middleman involved. Instead, people from all over the world help move the digital money by validating others' Bitcoin transactions with their personal computers, earning a small fee in the process. Bitcoin uses the blockchain by tracking records of ownership over this digital cash, so only one person can be the owner at a time and the cash can't be spent twice, like counterfeit money in the physical world can. But Bitcoin is just the beginning for blockchains. In the future, blockchains that manage and verify online data could enable us to launch companies that are entirely run by algorithms, making self-driving cars safer, help us protect our online identities, and even track the billions of devices on the Internet of Things. These innovations will change our lives forever, and it's all just beginning. To learn more about the urgent future of the blockchain, from the Institute of the Future, which uh, I also work with. So we, we, the, the, the thing about blockchain is, is, is thus, it's not just a technology, it's part of a family of technologies in a data ecosystem. It's allow you to have autonomous trust, in effect. And, and so it raises really fundamental questions about how to, what kind of institutions we're gonna have in the future. And, and so can you have governance without governments? We've always thought that we have to have people in the loop, we're gonna vote people, put them in, but what if you can have effective governments, governance through algorithms? And what about authority, uh, authorization without people, uh, authorities? Again, it's be becoming algorithmic. And regulations without regulators. A lot of people have that idea. <laughs> um, but it, it, it's, it's the only way you can deal with the scaling and the complexity of what's going on. When you have trillions of devices out there on the edge and you can have you can have basically what was once supercomputers, ARM chips out there, 64-bit processors, running some kind of credential or test and algorithm tying into the cloud and themselves learning from others. We sort of relinquish to, to these devices a lot of our own control. And this is very, <laughs> this is very dis, uh, disarming, but this is where the AI comes in. This is where you're gonna, you're, you're gonna need to have certain learning algorithms, self-correcting algorithms, you're get, we're going to have to create a whole new ecology of governance and oversight, and it ties into how we think about the law. And the whole notion of what a judge, and what, how do you adjudicate something? If there's a failure in the system, what's the right claims of one party? Do we want to go to the courts? The court's going to take far too long. Um, so it's really forcing us to think about things fundamentally in a way that we've never had to, or, or could before. I mean, there's an opportunity to have really good governance, which is, which is a lot of people thought that was not possible. Um, it's a common theme across all sectors. I think uh, uh, Arthur made a really good point, is that banking used to think of about it as being a vertical, but it's actually now becoming horizontal. And it's everything become layers and API calls, and you're decentralizing all services and they interact with each other. Our normal way of thinking about sectors, whether it be energy sector, financial sector, transport sector, is, is that they're all decentralized, they're all data driven, you're gonna have algorithms on top of them, uh, you're virtualizing physical processes to optimize and rapidly learn and innovate. And part of the thinking around this is uh, how do you govern it? Our approach is to look at this as a commons. There's a data commons, and I won't go into too much detail because I'm running out of time, was a, a, a Nobel laureate, Eleanor Ostrom, who developed a, a theory of how you govern a commons. And she looked at traditional people and she said, well, how, how do they govern their fisheries? How do they, 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 they govern their, their forests in a way that doesn't deplete them? And how, when you have a common resource, are there ways in which you can design governance me mechanisms 
that don't result in the depletion of, of that common resource. And of course, the seas and the skies and a lot of things are all part of that. So this is a f existential challenge to creating new kinds of institutions. And what I would argue is, is that we're moving into a network state. It's not the static top-down states, networks of networks. And the question then is how do you define sovereignty within the state? And how do you provide rights and how do you exercise the powers in networks versus sort of static structures? And so what I'd like to say is in the rights, what, how do you guarantee certain rights within networks? And what are the means the powers to do that? Do you have the right of expression, privacy, and security, and trust? These aren't just like to have. These are absolutely necessary to have. You can't have a functioning society unless if people don't trust their institutions and can't be captured by special interests. And the powers, the interesting thing is what makes a good state, an effective state, effective governance state, is the exercise of technology. Architecture is policy. How you architect a peer-to-peer -peer network versus a, a hub-and-spoke network, how, where it breaks down, how it corrects itself. All these architectural issues that seem to be technical issues are now social issues. And this is where the blockchain comes in. Because there isn't one blockchain. There's many blockchain designs. There are different notions of how you achieve your consensus algorithm. It's just not a proof of work. You have notions of proof of stake. You have proof of standing. You can treat it as a commons. You can have designed different kind of incentive mechanisms. They don't have to be zero sum. They can be cooperative game. So we have an opportunity to explore new ways of social organization we've never had before. And the idea is, when you, how do you define the boundary? We used to define it physically. But now it's what, what networks you're a part of and what kinds of protections and services those networks provide. The same thing is that people being a part of a network, it's not all about rights. There are certain duties that each party has on one another. So you can't, you're accountable in a network. It's not, so you have an obligation to others to not do and appropriately exploit the network. So you have to design governance mechanisms to do that as well. I'd just like to take one quick example. We, we talked about Uber and Lyft and, and ride hailing services and autonomous vehicles. I mean, the profound thing about that is when you think of transportation systems as a static system like subways. But when you use a data-driven, whoops, time over, um, you can dynamically allocate seats. You can dynamically allocate resources. It's all based on the data. And you can have, that's what underlies autonomous vehicles. So when you're having the new notion of transportation and why autonomous vehicles are going to come here a lot faster than you think, self-driving cars, is that you're not going to own a car. It's going to know something about you. It's going to come to you. And you're going to make much more efficient use of the resources. You're not going to have the traffic jams and, the, and, and won't have the pollution and other things that come around as a result of it. This is something that's happening very, very fast now. But in order to do that, you have to have data on people. The better, more data you have on people, the better the service is. It's just not your GPS data is what does it collect by, by uh, say, Uber. Now, you really, the more you know about the person, the habits, and who they interact with, the better you can design experience. That creates a challenge. You have to have ways of being able to verify people, create a biobehavioral metric that you are your own key, your own password. You're going to be able to enroll in something. You don't have to go to a bank. You don't have to have government agents. You do everything off the phone. You can have a personal data container you can spin up and put everything in the cloud, secure that, and share it on a principled basis. The technology is there to do that. So you create a data commons architecture, a totally decentralized architecture, in which you can have different service layers to meet different requirements. Won't go into too much. But the key concept here is you have like tokens of credentials. I make an assertion of a, a, a certain credential. It gets signed by a third party autonomous uh, uh, authority. And I can have baskets of these, collections of these, that give me permission or not permission. And that token could be a credit score. That token can be based on a credit score that changes over time. I can give it. I can revoke it. They can be wrapped in little contracts. This is where the, the technology of Ethereum comes in. They have a contracting language, smart contracts. All these things are possible. Uh, and they're being done now. Um, and what's really interesting is, is that the EU data regulations become, a, they're a driver of this. And I'm not always big on the EU data regu regulations. But in this case, I think they really did it right. 
And so they're changing a new kind of marketplace. They're giving people control over their personal data. They create a cost. They make a distinction between a data controller and a data processor. There's liability for being a data processor. But if a person is their own controller, you can also let out some of that liability. They can get access to the data. They don't have to re-identify you at every point. But you start to create a new marketplace of tokens and not preying upon people to get their data. So just conclusion, the change is really exponential. We still think of it as being linear. And so these very fast loops are happening. Our in organizational institutions have long loop cycles, and therefore everything gets out of phase. We have to have shorter decision reaction loops. Everything's virtualized. Self-sovereign networks. The idea you have these networks that are self-sovereign themselves, they have their own credentials, and they govern themselves. I'll leave it with that. Thank you. John, thank you so much for uh, sharing this knowledge about uh, trust and, and identity and all the developments that will uh, come to us and, and what's actually necessary to make it uh, really work and, and uh, also make it sustainable. So thank you so much for that. And talking about sustainability, uh, it gives me a great opportunity to introduce uh, the next speaker, who will be uh, Jan Raas. Jan uh, is uh, working with Amin Amro Bank, uh, a very dynamic bank, I must say, in the Netherlands. Uh, Jan has a long uh, history of, of working with data, working with sustainability, working with new business models. And today he's going to talk about uh, the, the global goals, the, the development goals in relation to banking. So banking for development goals, I think, is a very uh, good combination. Uh, and also very much uh, related to uh, the things I was uh, talking about when we talked about this holistic uh, notion of value. So Jan, uh, I would really like to invite you to come to the States and uh, share with us your knowledge about uh, sustainable banking and the role that banks can play in making a better future. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Paul. Thank you Jan. Yet. Thank you. Welcome to my presentation. Um, I see there's some of you around that work for banks. That was a minority. And actually, I will be talking about value creation. And again, that's something that's valid for more than one company. So let me just see if I can get my first slide on. That's not my first slide. OK. So my role is the role of sustainability advisor at a Dutch bank headquartered in Amsterdam. And I always had this little issue with my role, how to explain sustainability. I think few of you in the room have the same image when you think of something vague as sustainability. So in September 2015, my life actually became a lot easier. Why? Because the United Nations in New York, together with 197 member states, agreed on the targets of the global goals. They are also called the Sustainable Development Goals, or the SDGs, in an abbreviation. There's 17 of them, and actually for me, they are the book of sustainability in 17 chapters. So again, it makes, a lot, it, makes it a lot easier to tell which impacts banking has on society with a horizon of 2015, when they started, until 2030, because these goals are val valid for the next 15 years, and they are valid for member states, but also for companies like ours. And banking plays a very crucial role, because as we all know, money makes the world go around, right? And that's really what happens. Now, um, it would be very easy if these goals would achieve themselves, but that's not the reality. Actually, it takes work and it takes practice. Uh, over the next 15 years to actually achieve them. And they stimulate transition. They, st they stimulate a lot of innovation. They stimulate transition from our old mobility systems, our old energy systems, to new ones, and um, better recycling facilities for all the stuff that we consume during our lives. So that's the positive side of um, what the SDGs bring along. But there's an elephant in the room. And that elephant in the room is attached to the human condition. And I'm taking 10 challenges here attached to being human, taken from a paper on collapse of societies by UCLA, Institute of the Environment and Sustainability. And I'll go through these 
10 human behaviors with you and attach, attach how b banks can create value within that context. Because that context is real, and that context has actually the, um, uh, the power to eat uh, the global goals. So at the end, in 2030, we wouldn't have anything. Because as um, um, uh, a science, scientist said before me, uh, culture has the power to eat strategy for breakfast. So let's start with the first one and take it from the top. How do you react to, uh, as a bank um, towards the finance of customers in agricultural commodities if you know that deforestation and habitat destruction are often connected to uh, producing agricultural commodities? Let's take the palm fruit to start with. It looks more or less like this, uh, a palm oil uh, plantation. It's something we put in our food, so it's a positive thing. And some people say that this is aesthetic, but you could also say it impoverishes the biodiversity of uh, the forest, the native forest that has been chopped to replace it with one kind of tree, which is the oil palm. And that's a true statement. So if you find us this type of agricultural commodities and you take it within the context of those global goals, then you can see that actually you are contributing to goal number two in a positive way, no hunger, but there are some other value destructions that loom around the corner, if you don't watch out, that are attached to the products that you actually finance. And I'm not only talking about palm oil, I'm also talking about soy, coffee, cacao, tobacco, forestry products, wood, uh, sugarcane, and cotton. And for cotton, for example, the production of cotton um, has the potential to pollute a lot of water if it's not biological cotton. And in general, for all these mentioned agricultural commodities, we do care as a bank to ask questions to the entrepreneurs we, loan, we lend the money to on what working conditions there are on the plantations. So the SDGs matter, and they are not only to measure our positive impacts and to report on those, but also to be able to talk about the potential negative impacts that we have with our money. The second one. Oh, yeah, sorry. I just want to mention this one. Tobacco is a bit of an odd one in the list that I mentioned because you can't eat it, but you could have reason to ban it for health reasons. Our bank is gradually phasing out finance to tobacco producers because of the fact that we have many customers um, uh, whose mission actually is related to health and who have asked us to take a better and stronger position on that. So there they go. Now, the second thing that is attached to the human condition is that we have, over the last centuries and decades, always been troubled by water management issues or soil management issues. In, in Holland, because of the fact that the land is under sea level, uh, for most, most of Holland is under the sea level, we are champions in water management. And with renewable energy getting more attention, there, are, there is also more energy from hydro, or water power, as they say. And, um, well, nothing wrong with that. It's good to finance a dam. But what do you need to think of? You need to think of, for example, what happened in Lake Urmia in Iran. There was a lake, the sixth biggest lake in the world, the sixth biggest salt lake in the world, and it dried up over the course of 30 years. And this is how it looks like uh, today. It shrank to 10% of its, its size. So this is really an impact that, as a bank, you should be aware of that they can happen. Just not finance the dam with your eyes closed. Finance it with your eyes open to prevent, for example, uh, a situation like this where all leisure opportunity, where all biodiversity has actually gone from the area. So we as a bank have, obviously, criteria for financing dams. We do finance dams, but only with conditions. Conditions attached to what they do for the biodiversity, and positively, what they contribute to renewable energy. That's a positive impact. And again, I'm using that framework of the SDGs to make it something that our relationship managers can also understand and talk to the customers about. Now, the third part of human condition, we've been over hunting, over fishing, quite a lot of species. 
and put this in context of modern society, we raise a lot of our food ourselves. And we do that in various qualities, whether we're talking poultry uh, or beef or pork or fishing. And again, the good aspect is that they contribute to goal number two, SDG number two, no hunger, but they have quite some impact on climate. Huh? And they can have an impact on the biodiversity if you raise fish in the open ocean, things like that. So that's finance plus, I would say. It's finance plus extra conditions because you are more aware about which values you destroy and which values you create as a company. And obviously, from a cultural perspective in Holland, it's easy to say, and we do have that in our policies, that we exclude whale hunting, that we exclude anything to do with whale hunting. Even if 150 years ago, when our company was founded, the Eben Amro Bank exists for quite a while, there was within the finance portfolio, there was obviously some whale hunting going on. But now we have excluded it because that simply um, suits the type of bank that we are. Because why would you kill such a big animal to put it in a can? Come on. Same goes for shark finning, hard exclusion. I know it's eaten a lot in Hong Kong and, and China, but we exclude it. We do not finance the catching of sharks because most of the animal actually is discarded and only the fin is used. So we think that's a waste of uh, natural capital. But we know as a bank that it happens. We just decide not to finance it. And that point is related to the effects of finance on biodiversity. We finance ab about a thousand chips, and we know they carry ballast water from, for example, Asia to the Americas, for the Ameri from the Americas to Europe and to Africa. This is an international trade. And we support that because 90% of goods is transported by water, a very important function to finance and support. But again, not with your eyes closed for the effects it has on biodiversity. This innocent creature, this little lobster, was introduced in Holland from the US, but its by effect was that it killed the native species of lobsters that we have. So now we have a red one and we used to have a gray one. It's not a big impact, you could say. You can catch it and eat it. But still, it's there. And you need to be aware when you're financing such large assets, assets as a ship that these tiny details do matter in the long run. And it also goes for urban sprawl. We have 150 billion euros of mortgage financing, so we need to be aware of the impact that the built environment has on the natural environment. And this is really um, a field that's in, in ev evolution. I wouldn't say many banks already do this, but we are experimenting with what it means to be biodiversity, biodiversity neutral or biodiversity positive. How can you organize that, that your financing to your customers contributes to biodiversity and not kills it. Now, continuing on that human condition and what we do. Obviously, there's a scientific agreement on man-made climate change and the introduction of toxins in our environment, right? The guy who coined it, you might not know, is a Swedish scientist. You see him here, he's called Arrhenius. And Arrhenius worked, obviously, as a scientist in uh, the 19th century, early 20th century, worked for the Swedish government. And he was going to his parliament and saying, great, we have global warming and Swedish agriculture will prosper because the, if we keep on burning wood and coal, the temperatures will rise and Swedish agriculture will produce more food for the Swedes. Little did he know that we would have a global economy and that now there's a general consensus, I think 50 years later, the consensus shifted that for humanity as a whole, for all people on Earth in all places, that global warming is, um, has a negative balance. He did get the Nobel Prize, by the, by the way, because his calculations on the chemical processes of adding CO2 to the atmosphere were recognized as completely accurate. And this is really the scenario, it will start in a minute, the animation. This is really the scenario that we want to avoid and that we want to take action on. And we know that finance contributes to this. We want to avoid that the warming up of the Earth, which we've been measuring now for more than 150 years, 
goes beyond the one and a half uh, degrees um, warming, and especially not to the two degree uh, level. And we also want to avoid that we have to run the uh, marathon with, with the gas mark, just like these guys do uh, in Beijing. Remember that when it was almost um, abolished, it couldn't go through because the air quality was too poor. There were too many particles in the air, up to 300 particles per cubic meter, nanoparticles, that can affect your lungs. So these people, I think they were running in process. It was, it was ran, but it was also a moment that the Chinese government had to admit that their air quality was very poor. And that's maybe very recently the time that they started taking significant, significant action. So that's what the new world looks like. It looks like solar. It looks like wind. This is the variety uh, in the sea, yeah? uh, maritime uh, wind turbines. But we also need them on land. And it's happening in Korea. I saw the ambition of Jeju Island, your small, lovely island, um, to be carbon free by 2030. And they already have buses with swappable batteries on top. They actually look identical to normal buses. You wouldn't see the difference. They make a lot less noise. So they're very nice to um, walk next to and to travel in. Um, but it's a great invention. It's a, it's a Korean invention. So you guys are on it. And we, as a bank, would rather finance this kind of innovation to stimulate a carbon-free economy than to stick with the old guns. And I'm not saying we don't finance the old guns, because we do finance oil and gas, but we believe in a transition. So we want to see that our customers work on that transition as well. And in Holland, it pays to say that climate, the issue of climate, has to do with wet feet and not with hotter or the desertification. Because we are so low uh, below the sea level, the Dutch, that's really what they need to be scared of. A lot of wet feet due to rain falling, a lot of rain volume falling, falling in a short time period and um, simply um, the earth not being able to take it all up. So we translate this in SDG number 13, climate action. And there's a bigger picture, obviously, because we have been enticed, we have been lured into being better consumers. And I think uh, we will all agree that we would rather have a washing machine than spend a couple of hours a week doing that kind of chores. So we see the positive aspects of our consumption. And this is the type of an advertising, i show it to you because I, I like the, the movie, that got us there, that got us to the point that more than 2 billion people have moved into middle class and using similar ap appliances around the globe, but at a cost. Can I have some sound on this one? It doesn't? Okay. It's got a very nice tune. And heat your whole happy house. With electricity. All for a dollar a day? You can. All for a dollar a day. When you're living the total electric way. Now, you can do it for a dollar a day. When you're living the total electric way. Okay. So the total electric way for one dollar a day is in uh, contemporary dollars, it's uh, 300 dollars a month, so it's not a free lunch, so it's still a luxury. But again, a lot of people afford themselves these luxuries shown in this movie. Huh? And that has an effect on the raw material usage, on the restoration of ecosystems on this earth, and we now calculate an Earth overshoot day. That's the day in the calendar year that actually we have consumed the energy, the water, the raw materials that the Earth can regenerate. So ideally, that would fall on 31st of December. But as it falls on 8th of August, we're consuming right now about one and a half Earths, as they say. So comfortable living comes at a price. And for a bank, it has a consequence. The consequence is that you need to strategize you need to make policies to face your customers in a positive way, but to also ask them what their impacts are, what their positive impacts are, and what their negative impacts are. So we're talking about energy finance that we do. We talk about manufacturing that we finance and the impact. We talk about mining, because all those raw materials need to be mined or reused. 
We talk about real estate, commercial real estate, and we talk about the chemicals that go in them. And again, the focus is on shared value creation, and the balance should be positive. Now, the seventh part of the human condition, or the seventh part of culture that can eat the goals, is slavery and discrimination. And I hear you think, slavery and discrimination, come on, Jan, we're in the 21st century, what are you talking about? Now, the Indian government did a poll and actually did a research on how many slaves there are in India. And normally I would have you guess as a room, but I'm going to tell you straight away. It's 1.4% of the Indian population, 18 million people, that do not have the full rights of their own time. Some of them can go to the market, but they end up being slaves because they actually cannot decide to quit their jobs. That's real slavery. And that's also attached if we finance entrepreneurs that are active in these areas. So we want to know what they do with the money that we lend to them. It's a fair question. And we have taken a vulnerable stance in that as a bank because we have, we have a human rights statement that states that we respect human rights and that we expect our uh, customers uh, and our employees to respect human rights. But we have some vulnerabilities because we are globally active. And when you're globally active, you work in all kinds of areas with all kinds of labor conditions. And this report states some of those uh, vulnerabilities. So what you work on then, if you translate it into SDGs, you work on number 10, reduced inequalities, and number eight, decent work and economic growth. That's what you do when you ask extra questions or extra efforts from the companies that you work with. And number eight is conflict. And why am I showing an electric wire? Because when we get a credit um, approval process going on for uh, a wire manufacturer, one of the questions that we ask is, what is the wire used for? And if the wire is used for weapons, we want to know where the weapons go to. We want to know the value chain. We want to know whether it is delivered to democratic regimes. So that's the story of the wire. And again, that contributes to number 16, peace, justice, and strong institutions, because we believe, believe in the right of self-defense of democratic. Um, but we also believe that we have the right to know what the wire is actually servicing in the whole value chain. And we exclude a, a number of things. Anti-personnel mines, we exclude cluster bombs, and those are very obvious because they are also dictated by law. And another thing is you need the right leadership. The right leadership, like the Pope has shown, he's, he's written an encyclic which reads a lot like a pamphlet from Greenpeace. He talks about our common home and the ecology that we live in and to respect it. And we need people like Elon Musk, who actually uh, um, um, uh, give the technology for our mobility and for our energy production. Those are great leaders. Take examples the, uh, to those, and not of, of the ones that continue with the more old-fashioned uh, technologies. And leadership can also be shown, and that was shown, when the Paris Agreement was reached by 196 world leaders. And 143 have gone to their parliaments and asked them to ratify it. Huh? And also South Korea is part of the party. And the last one I'm finishing with is, why are we speaking about this? There was a guy in the 18th century that already warned that population growth would be too big for the Earth to keep up with the pace of population growth. But he was really set aside as a very negative person. Don't listen to that guy. He's a preacher. He's always saying negative things. If we would have lived today, Thomas Malthus he was, we probably would have thought he would be more right. And that has to do with that all those impacts, all those nine impacts that we mitigate or that we um, take into account when we do our financing get increased, the severity gets increased by the, the sheer population size and especially by the number of people that join the middle class over the next 10 years. Now, just to give you a picture, Paul, on how b what a bank looks <laughs> that applies these uh, sustainable development goals. If you put them on top of the bank, 
then it looks like this. These are the impacts that we do, that where we can create value or we can destroy value. And again, I advise you all, and I hope to inspire you all, to study the SDGs better. And the good news is they're also available in Korean. Kamsahamnida. Jan, thank you so much. Uh, I think it's a very important topic how indeed the finance industry interacts with every, uh, almost every aspect of society. And I think you uh, made it very clear to us how that works and what banks can do and also what banks shouldn't do. So thank you so much for that. Uh, we come to the last uh, contribution today, last but not least. Uh, I would like to uh, introduce Mr. Marcel van Galen to you. Uh, we have been uh, uh, informed already by uh, John Klippinger about uh, the importance of trust online. And there is somebody here in the room, his name is Marcel Gale, who uh, breathed uh, trust, who is uh, dedicating his whole life to how we can uh, work and, and live together on the internet in an uh, environment of trust, where we can keep our own identity. Uh, where uh, yeah, the, your, your digital uh, existence is as important as your physical existence. And he has been dreaming of this already for more than 10 years, and he has not only been dreaming about it, but he also has been working on it with many people, with uh, many organizations, and he has come a long way. And uh, he will share with us today his, uh, well, his approach, his vision, his dream, and also some of the results that he already has obtained. Uh, part of that is, a, is an app that uh, you are very much invited to, uh, to download. Uh, he will uh, talk about it. It's called Dapper. Uh, you will find uh, something in the back of your uh, program. Uh, I think it's uh, the uh, second but, uh, but one last page. You will also see a logo here on the banner. But uh, let's not waste any more time. I will invite Marcel to come to the stage. Marcel has a long uh, tradition in, in design, in, in, uh, in, in, yeah, in communication. And, uh, well, again, uh, this, this uh, idea of key, which is his, uh, his uh, view on uh, yeah, your identity, your tr uh, the trust and, and the privacy on the Internet, is something that is absolutely worthwhile to stay and, and, and uh, be here for the last 20 minutes of this session. Marcel, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Paul, and uh, what a great honor to be here. Thank you, Money Today, for inviting me and my family. We have uh, a great time in uh, Seoul, and I really hope to contribute to this session with my ideas. And I'd like to inspire you with something which can be mind-boggling. So this is good between me and dinner, or me and going home, I think. Um, my name is uh, uh, Marcel van Galen. Um, and I want to talk with you about Social Network 3.0. And we name it 3.0 because the difference with normal social networks is that Social Network 3.0 you are part of. Today, as we uh, look at um, the, the Internet, let's see, play, yes, then um, we are not part of the, the digital world. And what I found it with a team of people is the Key Foundation. And the Key Foundation has the vision that we as human beings should be part of the digital ecosystem. We cannot be just visitors, as Paul said this morning. We have to be there, the internet of everyone and everything. And our mission is to give people control over their data. And I'm so proud that this is our mission, digital self-determination for everyone. And the most beautiful thing is, this started 10 years ago as an ideology. And the ideology became a regulation in Europe. People need to have control about their data. And I know as the day from yesterday, that when I came to companies telling them people should control their data, they thought I was crazy. They said, no, the customer is ours, and so are his data. Today, the world is turned, and we need to turn a bit more. And I want to show you how, because it's needed. With this regulation, indeed, there's said enough today. But it will affect the lives of you and me. And also for companies, it will affect how they have to deal with us, because otherwise, a lot of awful things can happen. 
And I don't want to stand still too much with the GDPR because the GDPR is Europe. But on the other side, if Korean companies or organizations come to Europe, they have to be compliant with the GDPR. So it's very interesting to talk about a bit. But the GDPR is not to frighten us. The GDPR is meant to innovate. It's meant to innovate. Let's think, let's rethink, and let's take care for people. Let's make ourselves and give ourselves a position in the digital world. And on whose agenda is not digital as top priority? On whose agenda is not cybersecurity as something we need to improve? And on whose agenda is not sustainability? And what I'm going to explain to you is the one-on-one -on -one connection is the key to sustainability. I would like to ask for a movie with sound to uh, wake you up a bit, and then I come back uh, to you. No one would have believed in the first years of the 21st century that human affairs were being watched from the timeless worlds of the World Wide Web. No one could have dreamed people were being scrutinized as someone with a microscope studies creatures that swarm and multiply in a drop of water. This is your world. For centuries, you have seen me as nothing but a target audience, distracting me with your fancy bells and whistles. Today, you try to profile me, feeding on my social media, logins, and other web trails. But actually, all you do is look at little pieces of my life, scattered all around the World Wide Web. And with no place of my own, you must realize you're never going to know who I am. You're never going to find the things I really want, simply for one reason. I don't exist in the digital world. Do you really want to know who I am? Do you really want to know what I want? Let me tell you. I want my data to flow freely, to be controlled only by me. I want a place that knows all about me, even more than you will ever need to know. A place in a social network that's truly mine and where my privacy is respected. A place that connects me with the source of my data so I can use, share, and do smart things with it. With a high level of assurance and trust. For me, for my friends, and for connected parties. I don't mind sharing my desires and wishes with you as long as we can have an equal and meaningful relationship. I'm ready to connect. Are you? This is what I mean with social network 3.0. And this is the world of today. We are not existing in the digital world. We are just the sum of hundreds of usernames and passwords. We are apps. And we just learned that we are not even the customer. We are the product. So where are we going? And if you look at what we are meaning with digital, then we can't even have a reliable digital one-on-one -on -one relation. It is true that many financials still sending posts 
to your physical home address because they can't transfer it digitally. This is the world of today. This is 2017. And is the world of today poisoned by data? The polluting of data is a very, very nasty thing. Some people said, OK, it's like the Industrial Revolution. It took 100 years to say to each other, OK, we are polluting. We should not wait for 100 years. So what is the solution? I took this picture from the movie. You see the one-on-one -on -one connection. Blockchain-based technology, one-on-one. -on -one. How can we create value for you as organizations while giving people back control about their data? This is not a matter of legislation or a directive. This is an ideology and this is a holistical way of looking at how we are living. We are too much part of the digital world to be only this visitor. We have to stop with that. So we need a reliable one-on-one -on -one connection where you and me can make our own choices. But how to do this? Well, I have good news for you. There are examples. Look at this. Everybody knows it. I came here, and I just went to the Starbucks, and I used this card. They didn't even blink with the rice. They just swiped the thing through a machine I never saw before, and I got my coffee. I don't have to think. I just use it. So what's happening here? This is a trust one-on-one -on -one connection in relation with payments. And me, as a customer, and every acceptance makes his or her own choices. Simplicity because of the complexity in what we call a scheme. We have to make appointments, worldwide appointments. And if you look at this, we all know what this is, our mobile phone. Everybody makes his own choice. The device he buys, the provider he takes. And how is it possible that we don't have to think? We just call. It's possibly because of a scheme, the GSMA. The, G the, G the GSMA scheme, the GSMA association. This is what's behind. So is there hope for this one-on-one -on -one connection? Yes, there is, because we need a reliable connection where we can make choices. And that can be simplified, and that's the work of the Key Foundation, a non-profit organization. And what I like to do is to place this in perspective with you as the financial industry. Because I liked what Arthur said about the vertical and the horizontal. You, you did a good thing, because you, you mentioned it also. So let's see what this means. This means that you and me can be a node in the system. And as an ode to, um, to, uh, to Paul, I make two Smurfs. That's typical Dutch as an owner of a node. So you and me are an owner of a node, a node in the system based on a scheme. But how to do this? Watch it. The scheme. This is the independent, non-profit part of the thing. It's just paperwork. Talking with lots of organizations, public and private organizations, organizational, legal, and technical. How to do it. And then the next thing. And this is the chance for the financial industry. The next thing is the implementation, because just paperwork won't help. We need a trust infrastructure, a trust framework based on a scheme. And here's where the financial industry, the governments, or the telcos come in, because they can implement. They know how to handle in relation with customers. They know what issuing is. They know what acquiring is. So this is the, this is the game of the financial industry. And with this game, you change your role from vertical to horizontal, because you are the secure place for, for me to rely on. I know you keep your promises, because you are part of a scheme. And if you don't, I know you will be kicked out of the scheme. That's trust. And based on, upon this, this infrastructure, 
the fun begins, because based upon the infrastructure, apps are helping you. And the app Buan and Paul talked about earlier, just an app, as an example, is dapper. Constantly in progress, making use of this infrastructure, this infrastructure make use of this scheme. And I really like to invite you to download it, to play with it, because this is the experience of having a one-on-one -on -one relation, subscribing to information of a, another. And I'm very proud that Money Today, and you can see the, the, the logo or the QR code you can scan to create this one-on-one. -on -one. The last page of the book or the, or the banner here on my side. And you ain't seen nothing yet, because if you have this connection with Money Today, you have this one-on-one. -on -one. And in the months to come, there will be more functionality. And I will show you, because what I'm going to do is explain you that I can have this note. And what's the nice thing is that if you download Dapper, you fill in your first and last name, you create a note, a very anonymous note. And we can have a connection, a connection based on this QR code. You have your own unique QR code. And then we, the two of us, have this peer-to-peer -peer connection. And within this peer-to-peer -peer connection, we can have consent for everything we do based on the blockchain. Or we can have this sovereign identity based on the blockchain. And here, of course, you can have other apps connecting to your node. And one of the first who did this was Aegon. They are a huge insurance company with 60 million users, 2.5 in the Netherlands. And what they did is they made a login, and I will try to, to show you uh, in a live demo. Um, maybe we can go to the um, uh, Chrome browser, if you want. It's very interesting because my laptop is there and I have to manage it here. So this is uh, interesting. If you go, maybe you can just do it, go to the login, uh, the right uh, top. Um, oh, you have to make it bigger now. <laughs> yep, that's it. Login. It's looking. Yep. Well, you see here on the home page of Aegon, you can log in on different ways. But if you uh, go to uh, Dapper, this is uh, this one, the up top one, indeed, then you see what will happen. You get, uh, uh, you, you can push if you didn't do it. Um, let me see. Uh, did you push already? Just push. Yeah. Then you see what will happen. Here comes uh, the QR code to log in on Aegon. So you make this one-on-one -on -one connection. And if you do this, maybe if, is, is someone able to scan with, with Dapper this QR code? Then you will see what, what happens. The first one will make the connection. So try it. <laughs> what will happen, namely, is that uh, if someone did manage, you will see the screen changing changing in a one-on-one con one -on -one connection uh, with you. Um, I yeah, you manage, Paul? <laughs> yep. Paul made this, uh, this connection. You will see that at, at the side of Paul is now uh, is created a connection with Aegon. And here on the screen, uh, the screen says, OK, um, nice that we have a connection, but we don't Oh, n we don't know you today. OK, what you have to do is you log in once, or you uh, create an account, and then Aegon knows, ah, you're the one in this trust network which made a connection with me. Well, the interesting thing is that what I'm um, going to show you now is um, the perspective of, of this Aegon with a, with a demo account. Um, what I will do is... Um, I take my uh, phone here, um, and what I do is um, I have this, this Alan here. This Alan and you have one, just one card, but Alan uh, is better off because she has a personal card with her own self-declared personal information. She works at a company, um, not full-time, because she has also her own company with own credentials. But another interesting thing is she can create an extra card. 
and she can create a validated card. And this makes it interesting for the banking industry as well, because um, in the Netherlands, we have a, 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 some kind of systems to know that you are the one you are, to let other parties know. And one of the systems is EDIN. It's, uh, it's done by the banking industry. The bank knows who you are. So if I choose here uh, this EDIN, um, you see here the template for Ellen for secure validated information. And when she connects, she chooses her bank. And I say yes here. She does her thing at the bank. Done. And here is the information Ellen has validated. It's a connection with the bank. She can even make an anonymous connection. And I will show you why this is interesting. Because I go to Aegon. Um, Paul just had this card at Aegon. The first interesting thing is that Aegon has this green sign behind the name. And that means that Aegon respects the rules and regulations of the scheme. Uh, the following thing is that you can log in at Aegon uh, with a touch. And I just go to Aegon because I'm in a secure environment. The next thing is that I can set attention controls. I'm in control of what I exchange and what I want from this company. It's a one-on-one -on -one relationship. And I can, I can decide. Another interesting thing is that you also decide that I can do payments directly. And I can decide the frequency, frequency in which I want to receive information. But another interesting thing is that I can have uh, a chatbot through this one-on-one -on -one channel. Um, and I can say, okay, uh, my date of birth later. Uh, secure mail, Aegon can send me very sensitive information through this channel. But to finish uh, this Ellen, Ellen can look right in the top, the E, uh, what she shares with Aegon. And what she shares today is her credentials as you see here. But what she does now, she adds attributes. And what she finds is an attribute she has available from her bank she adds, and Aegon now has this set, and Ellen sees what she shared with Aegon. The whole consent handling, we use the blockchain, because everybody needs to see what the status is of the consent. Um, actually, this is um, what I wanted to show you, and I can entertain you for one hour, as you can imagine, but maybe we should... Um, uh, we should uh, go back to the, um, um, to the uh, PowerPoint slides um, because I have a few seconds left. And then I go um, through uh, something which we are proud of, of course. Last year, we won the, the Diamond Award in the insurance industry because the insurance industry likes to innovate. And we are very proud of Aegon uh, setting this first step. And there are more to follow. Um, here you see some of the advantages, but I think I don't even have to summarize because you, you understand. And again, with Aegon, we have this co-creation. We, we do not sell a product, we sell co-creation. And co-creation, this is what I, I, what I name collaborate. We need to collaborate. And there is a, a famous guy who already said it, that it's even the best way to predict your future. Let's collaborate. And actually, this is what I like about what we are doing with the Key Foundation. As a nonprofit, we collaborate. We collaborate to be able to give you and me this place in the digital world. And my call to you here in Korea, in Seoul, is let's collaborate. Create value for your organization while giving people control about their data. And I really would appreciate it if you would think about becoming a member adding expertise, and help to fund this ambition. Thank you very much for your attention, and have a very good stay in uh, Seoul. Marshall, thank you very much for this uh, warm uh, story. Um, I, I think, indeed, it is very worthwhile for you to, to download Dapper. Uh, uh, what I think one of the nice things I think is, is in, uh, like Marshall uh, indicated, you control the data. So if you change something in the in the in the tool, then everything, uh, everyone who has connection with you will see the updated information. So you control what's in your 
in your contact book. Very good. Um, this is the end of, of the session. Uh, we do have a little time left for Q&A, and that will be done by uh, Mr. Buambien. He will, uh, he will uh, lead uh, the Q&A session, uh, and uh, all, the, uh, all the speakers are still here, so feel free to ask questions. Thank you, Paul. Yeah, thank you for uh, uh, your contribution uh, in the second session. Uh, 질문 시작하기 전에 지금 뭐 자리들이 많이 <웃음> 비었습니다. 예. 아, 장시간 동안 먼저 예, 같이 이렇게 참여하시느라 고생들 하셨고요. 혹시 남아 계신 분들 중에 이 질문을 꼭 한번 해서 어, 물어봐야겠다 하시는 분들 계시면 한 한두 개 정도 질문 받도록 하겠습니다. 없으세요? 예. 어 저희 그 연사들은 예, 항상 여러분들하고 언제 어느 때든지 어 커넥티드 되기를 원합니다. 예, we are fully committed to connect with you all the time. So please do not hesitate to contact us if you have any questions in the future. And we are ready for that. 다시 한번 여러분들 장시간 동안 고생 많으셨습니다. 예, 수고하셨습니다. <웃음>